Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. I will wait a few minutes for everyone to hop on, but I'm super excited to be here and hopefully answer questions about a really tough cancer that we see in dogs. We're going to be talking about hemangiosarcoma in dogs and splenic masses in general, but this is the most common one that we see, and it's such a devastating cancer. And so we've gotten some good questions ahead of time. I got my list of questions, but please, if you're hopping on, um, tell me uh, who's here and where you're from, and hopefully the connection will be good. Um, hey, Lynn, welcome. Thank you for joining me so much. Last week, I did um, one of my office hours for veterinary professionals, and we had a little bit of issues um, with my internet connection. So hopefully this time we won't have that. Uh, if any of you have kids that play Fortnite, what I learned is that I let my kids, hey Kara, let my kids play Fortnite last week while I was doing this and apparently that sucked my internet speed. So hey Caitlin, thanks for joining. So um, probably gonna have a good number of questions. I hope, you know, I do these questions here to help everybody and I really hope that um, we can talk about this cancer. Felicia, I believe I have some of your questions, so I'm glad that you're here. Um, I believe you're the one that sent me some of the questions about su supplements and things to look for. So we'll dive in in a few minutes, um, and um, hopefully um, we'll get through everything. A couple announcements I just wanted to make. So a few days ago on the Facebook page, we launched um, an ebook. So 18 things that you should know about dog cancer. Hey, uh, Rihanna, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. From Cleveland, that's actually where my husband is from and where my in-laws still live in the Cleveland suburbs. So we have an ebook um, that you can, you have to comment on that post and you should get some uh, message in Messenger and then we will send it to your inbox. So if you're interested in that and you wanna download that, just uh, go back. I think we posted it on Wednesday, so not too far down on, uh, on the page. Other things, so each month I try to do a theme, and so this month is obviously we're talking about hemangiosarcoma. So if you're not following the page, um, you'll definitely wanna scroll back, and we have posts about every other day maybe about hemangiosarcoma. So the tips that we're gonna be talking about and the things that you wanna know. If you're a veterinarian or a veterinary professional, or you have a group, you know, if you're in a pet owner group and you wanna share these, please feel free to uh, share them, you know, share them wide, anybody that we can help deal with this cancer more than happy. If you have questions about other cancer guys, we've been doing this since the beginning of the year. So we have, and you can find these on the Facebook page in the photo album section. And there's one on dog lymphoma, one on cat lymphoma, uh, mast cell tumors, osteosarcoma, and things like that. So lots of good information if you have questions about other cancers as well. All right. And then Lynn, I see your question and I will definitely uh, come back to it. Um, Few other things I just wanted to mention. If you missed some of the other uh, Q and A's on every month we do these, you can find them on my YouTube channel, which is my reminder and my plea to please go and subscribe on the YouTube channel. In addition to these Q and A's that you can find, I have vlogs, video vlogs, so you can see what it's like for pets when they're coming into the clinic, getting chemotherapy, because I know when you probably hear that a pet needs chemo, if you haven't already gone through it, it sounds really scary, but dogs and cats do really, really well. Couple of other videos. Hi hey, from Australia. It must be. It must be tomorrow there. So happy Friday to you, Anna. Um, for um, something about Facebook, I was saying. Um, so on the Facebook channel, there's the uh, YouTube vlogs, so you can subscribe to them. And about once a week, you'll see what goes on behind the scenes in the clinic. And I have two vlogs that went up in the last month. One is number 42, and this is common myths and misconceptions about chemotherapy. Um, and that is number 42, so that's a great one to watch. We'll cover some of that tonight. And we're gonna try to throw these in the links, um, so hopefully they will be there, and it says it is Friday in Australia. And the other one, if you have a pet that's going through chemotherapy, is my top five medications that you should have on hand at home. You should receive them the day that you go home on the first day of chemotherapy. It's my just-in-case goodie bag, and that is all there. So we're gonna throw those in the comment sections, but again, you can find them on the YouTube channel, those two specific videos were number 38, that's the medications I recommend, and number 42 is common myths and misconceptions about pets going through chemotherapy. 
All right, so I have um, some other stuff, but we'll do that at the end. Um, thanks again for, jo for joining everybody. I'm super excited. Um, somebody from Brazil, so another Anna, that's great. We have a very international crowd tonight. So um, I am going to, so we are, um, if you're looking in the comments section, um, Let's see, we just put up this, the myths and misconception one right up there. That's vlog number 42. And then if we, sometimes I can't read when I'm talking. Um, the other um, number 38, that's the medication. So we'll get that one up there as well. So let's dive into some questions. So um, I have to scroll back down. So there we got the medications right there. So this is vlog number 38. And that's the medications I think that you should have on hand if your pet is going through chemotherapy. So let me scroll down and see if I can start to answer some of the questions that we have there. Um, right. So Zachary says, I love this question. Should it be part of the senior screen? So I probably missed the part one. Oh, that's probably from Lynn. So Lynn, um, golden retrievers in particular, do I recommend prophylactic screening? with abdominal ultrasound, thorax, and at what age? So that is a great question. I agree with you, Zachary. So the question is, um, do I recommend screening? And I do in general. The hard part is, um, it's a little bit different, you know, in people, and it's still controversial in people, right? Um, at what age should you start routine mammograms? Should it be yearly? Then it switched to every three years. I have to tell you, um, my doctor still believes that I should be doing it yearly, even though I'm low risk. So there will be variation as you talk to different doctors. But what is my recommendation? So especially if you have a high risk breed, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say most dogs and cats from middle aged and older, I think they should be having chest x-rays, three view chest x-rays, um, and abdominal ultrasound every six months. And I know what you're thinking. Wow. That's really frequent, Dr. Sue, but think about how dogs and cats age. They age very quickly. Larger dogs sadly age more quickly than small dogs. So middle age will change. That's why I can't give you an exact, you know, age, what should it be? So it's gonna be, you know, younger for a Great Dane than it's gonna be for a Schnauzer. But, you know, for a Golden, I would say maybe at age three, age four, get them annually, chest x-rays and ultrasound. And then as you start to get to middle age, five and six, I personally would go to every six months. Does that mean that we're gonna catch some of these aggressive cancers that develop quickly, but it allows us know, to know what baseline is for your dog and to be more proactive. And I also think getting to your veterinarian and getting physical exams, good physical exams, weights, some routine blood work, I think that those are helpful as well. So I think that it's a great question. Um, I personally, you know, what do I do in my dogs? For Matilda, who's nine, she's my black Labrador. Uh, she gets chest x-rays and ultrasound twice a year. Penelope, if you guys have been following, is my little, um, 16, 17 month old Labrador, um, who we think might have some early kidney disease that she might've been born with working through that. Um, but you know, she's not, she's had more ultrasounds than most one year old dogs, but that's because I call her my little lemon, but Penelope or Penelope as we lovingly call her um, is a little bit of a lemon. But again, middle age and older, I would start doing them twice a year. So hopefully that is helpful. Let's see Susan from Clifton Park. Um, Caitlin, we'll put your question up. Is there any way to diagnose hemangiosarcoma of the heart in the early stages of tumor development? So let's kind of back up. So what is hemangiosarcoma? Hemangiosarcoma is a malignant cancer of blood vessels, and we have blood vessels all over our body. In dogs, the most common, the number one location, location that you are going to see hemangiosarcoma is the spleen, and that's the main one that we're talking about. Um, the second most common location is the heart. It is a big blood vessel, so those you know um, those cells can transform and become osteosarcoma. But guys, we can see hemangiosarcoma anywhere in the body, anywhere we have blood vessels that can transform. So the the best type of hemangiosarcoma are the really superficial one that on biopsy is only affecting the really superficial layers, the skin or cutaneous hemangiosarcoma. The next best or the, is the next layer down, subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma. They do better than the deeper ones. Intramuscular involving the muscle layers, a little bit worse. And then the organ ones, which are called visceral, um, which spleen and um, heart and liver are the top three locations. Those have the, the worst or most challenging prognosis. 
So the heart-based ones are really, really hard. You might not even be able to pick them up on a routine chest x-rays. So as they're growing, you really need an echocardiogram. So an echo, um, which you know we're not routinely doing. So I don't know, that's a harder one for me to recommend doing echoes for on a routine basis because you need to find a cardiologist and it's a little bit harder to find and not the most common location. So not wrong to do, um, but again, a little bit harder um, one to routinely recommend. And again, chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound would be what I would start with. Uh, okay, so hopefully that was helpful. I'm gonna try to go through the questions as they come up. Otherwise I have to scroll down and they get lost. Um, and Felicia, I'm definitely have your, you had some great questions about um, supplements. So you can pop that in the comments, but I do have it written down on my sheet so I don't forget to come back to it. Um, so Cheryl says, lost my Shelly, a Rhodesian rib back 15 years ago to mangio of the spleen. And I'm so sorry for your loss, but you know, it still hurts, right? And it's why you're here. And I thank you for taking the time and having the courage to learn more about this cancer because it's really, really hard. And I'll be honest, guys, it's it's a challenging cancer. So I'm a very optimistic person when it comes to about treating cancer. There are a lot of cancers that we can significantly extend their survival times. And we can in dogs with hemangio, and we can run through the numbers just so everybody, we make sure everybody's on the same page for sure. Um, but they don't gain as much time as other cancers do. So like lymphoma in dogs, it's about one month without treatment. And then with a good chemo, multi-agent chemotherapy protocol, the median survival time is 13 to 14 months. And I know when people first hear that number, they think, wow, that's not really a long time. But if you compare a month to a year plus, that's pretty good. And think about how dogs age. And a year is equivalent to about five to seven years for us and people when they have cancer and they go to a human oncologist, they talk about five years survival time. So I do think a year is a reasonable period of time. Um, but the reason that hemangiosarcoma is frustrating is because with no treatment, it's usually weeks, right? With surgery, and we're talking about for the splenic form, so the spleen is removed, it's one to three months. If that mass is bleeding into the belly, you're gonna provide, you know, you're gonna paleate that dog, you're gonna make, take away their source of bleeding and they can still have a great quality of life in that time after surgery. But one to three months is, is short, right? Um, with chemotherapy, about six to nine months. And even with chemo, the one year survival rate is about 10%. So that's the really hard part. I'm not against treating. I just had this discussion with some veterinarians. I am very, for treating dogs with hemangio, but I'm frustrated as a medical oncologist that we're not doing more. There are some new exciting treatments in the pipeline, but it is still a frustrating cancer to treat. And it is so frustrating because it, it grows quickly and it's really hard to, you know, to detect early. Um, and, you know, I can tell you guys to feel your dogs for lumps and bumps and bring them to your vet and do a monthly exam, but you can't feel your dog's spleen. So it, that is where it definitely gets challenging. Uh, Lynn wants to know, and you're from Rhode Island, are there any preventative supplements? So preventative supplements, not necessarily. And, you know, I think probably a, a Q&A about prevention in cancer and things that we can do could be a, another whole topic. But if diagnosed with hemangio, there's definitely some supplements that I will add with or without chemotherapy, depending on what the family chooses. So one of the ones that I really like is an Asian mushroom mix. In the, there's two on the market. The one that was studied in dogs with hemangiosarcoma is I am Unity, and we'll throw that definitely in the comments because that's definitely one that you would want to check out. You can usually buy it from Amazon. It is an Asian mushroom polysaccharide it really bought long word for after a busy day. So it's an Asian mushroom mixture. And there was a study at Penn where they looked at dogs that there was only 15 dogs. Um, but they, um, after their spleen was removed, there was five dogs in each dose group and the dogs in the two higher dose groups. So 10 dogs that got the, um, the eye immunity Asian mushroom mix lived equivalent to a little bit longer than chemotherapy. So the ones in the higher group, um, I think it was 100 mg per kg, but don't quote me on that, um, lived you know six to seven months, which is what I told you was pretty comparable to chemotherapy without chemo. So I will use that in dogs with or without chemotherapy. 
Another one of my supplements, and guys, this is for any dog with cancer. Obviously, you want to talk to your veterinarian before you start these. Um, but the one that I really love is Apocaps, which is an all-natural plant-derived supplement with about six different plant supplements and uh, includes um, apigenin and luteolin and curcumin, which is from the turmeric spice. And so I will use those together. I like good, uh, a high quality fish oil in my patients as well for the anti-inflammatory properties. I don't routinely use Unim Bio, which is a Chinese um, supplement that can help stop bleeding. I use that if they're having bleeding issues, like if the cancer is spread to the liver and they're having intermittent bleeds. There's some thought that maybe it has an anti-cancer property, but I don't use it chronically in my patients, you know, as a preventative or after they've been diagnosed with hemangio, I use it in those cases with bleeding. It's also good for dogs with nasal cancer if they're having nosebleeds. It's one of my favorite uses for Unim Bio. Um, so those would be the supplements that I would use, Lynn. Um, yep, Apicaps, Unim Bio. Turkey tail is another mushroom. Those are really the basic ones that I'm using. Also, like I said, the fish oils, um, the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, someone says, I'm told turmeric is no good to thinning blood. I have not, I mean, maybe at higher doses, but I'm not seeing that issue, um, especially in dogs that aren't having bleeding issues. So um, I'm not, I'm using the amount that's in apicaps. I'm not using additional supplements. But guys, if you're really interested, you know, consult with a holistic veterinarian because they are going to be able to help you guide guide you through because there's a lot of supplements and the dosages get confusing and you want to make sure that there's no contraindications like you said like I can't make specific medical recommendations obviously for your pet through you know a live Q&A but I can tell you some things that I use and then you can talk to your veterinarian or a medical oncologist about it and hopefully that will help um Okay, so Rihanna says, we recently found out that our 13-year-old pit, I love pitties, has a cavitated liver mass and two smaller masses in his spleen. We have been told that hemangiosarcoma is high on the list of differentials, but this isn't confirmed by biopsy. We're consulting with an oncologist on Monday. We're concerned that a regular vet has put him on carprofen. Woodcarp, which is also Rimadil, um, so that's one of the non steroidal anti inflammatories. So, like Aleve for dogs or Motrin for dogs, but you don't want to use the human ones, that is a, a veterinary approved product. Would carprofen be recommended in a dog with likely hemangio, or would that increase the risk of rupture? Um, would I recommend PRED instead? And we answered the questions about uh, supplements. So Unibio, we talked about um, if they're having bleeding issues, if they, even if it's a mild bleed, so they see fluid in the abdomen on ultrasound that and you're seeing anemia issues, so low red blood cell count, you might wanna add that. Eye immunity, yes. Um, milk thistle, um, if, so milk this is a liver supplement. Um, if there are liver value elevations, it might be a good one to add, add, but not one that I would routinely use for most hemangiosarcoma unless we're having liver issues. Um, carprofen, I'm, you know, again, without knowing the, the details of your pet, Rihanna, I don't have any issues with them being on a non steroidal anti inflammatory um, while you're waiting to see the oncologist and should not make them more prone to rupture. So that would be my general recommendation about that. Um, I don't, Anna wants to know, do I recommend a keto diet? In general, I don't at this point. I think there's some interesting studies out there. Um, you know, some of the keto diets are, you know, some of the early thoughts about diets, you know, should they be Atkins-like? So um, we know that cancer cells like carbs, they like glucose. And so the idea that they're on a diet that is higher in proteins and fats, will that be better? So um, I haven't really been using a keto diet in my patients, um, so I don't have much comments on that. I would love to see more data about it for sure. Um, and another Anna, lots of Annas is, oh great, really good question. Is obesity a relevant risk factor for hemangiosarcoma? Not one that has been shown for sure. Um, so, but in people, to the two risk factors associated with cancers in general, lifestyle ones, are obesity and a diet low in fruits and vegetables. And so I think that is, you know, hasn't been studied very well in most cancers in dogs and cats, but I think there's a lot to learn from that. And so I do think it would be, you know, recommended to 
keep our pets lean. We know that uh, there was a great study in Labradors, which is my favorite, one of my favorite breeds, that's what I have. Um, and lean Labradors lived two years longer, guys, than overweight ones. So there's a good argument, maybe not for cancer, but just for general health. We know that obesity is associated with um, diabetes and other conditions as well. So I think that that is you know, just good information. There are a few studies looking at um, obesity. I think bladder cancer might have been one of them and they looked at them for mammary cancer. So again, there's not a lot of great studies looking at that for hemangio, but I just think as general health and you know, for our pets, keeping them lean is good. It's also good for arthritis, right? Less stress and strain on the joints there. So that would be um, my recommendations there. All right, so moving up the board, uh, this was a big question, can you guys see me? Here we go. Uh, I'll hide that and read it to you. So this is from Betty. Uh, welcome, Betty. Uh, she's thanking us for the discussion. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here and help. Uh, sadly, she lost her female eight-year-old shepherd, eight six, so not too long ago, about six weeks ago. Um, was sudden and unexpected, and unfortunately, that's really how it is with hemangiosarcoma. So just to kind of take a you know a little sidetrack. So. What are the symptoms? I wanted to make sure we talked about that. So Betty, thank you for you know letting me talk about that. So you know the hard part with hemangiosarcoma is the symptoms can be really vague and non-specific. You may just see an enlarged distended abdomen in your dog. They may not be eating, right? But you're not going to jump to hemangiosarcoma. They can be tired. They can be weak. Again, really mild and non-specific, or it's this dramatic. Your dog collapses. You look at their gums. They're very pale. You know, and they're shocky, and you're rushing them into your vet or to an emergency clinic. So, um, and it can really sneak up on us. One of the things that when we talk to pet owners after their pet has been diagnosed with mangio and, or a bleeding mass in the spleen is sometimes they say, hey, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they were kind of off for a couple of days and they were quiet, but then, you know, they kind of regained their energy. And some of those cases, I'm, we think that they had minor bleeds. And if the bleed is not, if their rupture is not so traumatic, they can absorb that blood. They essentially transfuse themselves. So, you know, that is something to kind of think about. I mean, not that I want you every time your dog's quiet for a couple of days, but that, you know, in hindsight, we know that a lot of the times that's what that could be. Um, so Betty sadly lost her dog within an hour of x-ray. So her question is, why is the cancer so aggressive? It is a great question and I don't have an answer except for to reaffirm what you know. It is a very aggressive cancer. 50% um, of dogs will have metastasis or spread at the time of diagnosis. So definitely this is one where you wanna do get chest x-rays before they go to surgery, make sure it hasn't spread to the lungs. But guys, and this is a really important but, and this is one of the you know graphics that we put up a couple of days ago. Just because your dog has a mass in the spleen does not mean that it is hemangiosarcoma. Even if you have a high risk breed, you know, German Shepherd, um, Labrador, you know, Rottweilers and things like that. So when you, when you break down the statistics, it's about 50-50. So 50% 50 of the dogs that have a splenic mass will end up being hemangiosarcoma. And you can have masses on ultrasound. So you get an ultrasound before you go to surgery and you can have a benign hemangioma look exactly the same as a malignant hemangiosarcoma. And in my lecture for veterinarians, I have two side-by-side -side ultrasound pictures and they look exactly the same and you cannot tell which is benign and which is malignant. One of the things that can increase our suspicion up to about 80% that it's hemangiosarcoma is, was it, is it bleeding? Is it ruptured um, without it? Obviously, so they have a hemoabdomen, blood in the abdomen without any evidence, the trauma. So they weren't hit by a car or anything like that. So that is going to be um, one of the things that is going to raise our index of suspicion. But again, ultimately, guys, Unlike the skin lumps and bumps where I'm going to aspirate them before surgery and know what it is, you're going to have to take your pet to surgery and wait on pins and needles for that biopsy to come back before we know if it's truly hemangiosarcoma. So that's really, really hard. So why is it so aggressive? I don't know, but it definitely is. Preventative tests. We talked about that. Great question. I do recommend from middle age and older. So bi-yearly. So if you have a large breed dog, maybe at age three, again, start doing chest x-rays and ultrasound once a year. And then as they're getting a little bit older, I would recommend you do it twice a year. Any good news on research? So again, great question, um, Betty. So 
there's a couple there's a couple of new things sort of in the pipeline or that are being studied. One is this new uh, treatment called EBAT, little e b a t, and this is um, being investigated at Minnesota. And this is a new compound, a new drug that targets some of these cancer stem cells in hemangiosarcoma and it looks like it will extend survival time and they're actually doing a study where they're screening certain breeds. I want to say golden retrievers. Yeah, it's Dr. Modiano, Lynn is asking. So at University of Minnesota and Antonello Borgatti, um, who's another uh, oncologist researcher there. So they're looking at this EBAT compound and they're doing a study called Shine On and I'm not sure if we can get the link in there, but they, Goldens, Portuguese water dog and another breed, and you start screening them, if they find these markers, then you're eligible to potentially get EBAT as a preventative. Um, and then they're looking at that as well. So hopefully we'll have this as a treatment and then maybe as a preventative for dogs that we can screen early, find this um, these markers in their cancer cells, which is a blood test and do that. So that would be really, really exciting. It's not commercially available. I don't have it yet, but it's definitely something interesting. Another um, couple of things in addition that are being studied, one is propan propanolol, which is a heart um, blood pressure medication, and that's being studied where I did my residency at Animal Medical Center in the city and looking to see if that has anti-cancer activity. And then the other one that we're looking at, I just wanted to see if I had any other information in my notes about the propranolol. Um, Yep, so that's the one that's being done at AMC. Um, seems to be very well tolerated. Like I said, it's a blood pressure medication. And then the um, other, so that's Losartan, sorry guys. And then the other one that they're looking at, which is propranolol, and that's the one, so again, sorry, Losartan is the one that they're studying at AMC right now. And the other one is propranolol, which is also a high blood pressure medication and used to treat migraines in people. And that one, um, we're not sure what the dosages and the dosages might have to be really high. So there are some definitely some new things out there. Um, and so here is the link guys um, for the studies at University of Minnesota. So there is some new research and that's exciting because for years when I would lecture at different veterinary conferences, there wasn't much to update. So I'm excited that, you know, this is something that when I go to conferences to learn that there are lectures on and there's new stuff coming out there. So like I said, this is a frustrating cancer and it would be great if we had more information. Um, I'm going to scroll back down because I know there were some other questions. Um, hey, Deanna, good to see you or hear you. Um, all right. Trying to go back down. Lots of questions, guys. I'm really sorry if I missed stuff. I'm doing my best. Um, okay, so I think, so I do I recommend splenectomy if it's already spread? So Jasmine asked that question. Um, tough question. So in general, uh, hey Jenny, in general, I have a, a more serious discussion with the family. So I have taken dogs to surgery. I don't do the surgery, but I've sent them to surgery with a really good surgeon because I don't do surgery anymore. But I have sent dogs to surgery that have lung mets. But we know that beforehand. What's really frustrating are the ones where x-rays weren't done before. The owner does the surgery and then finds out that there's metastasis or spread to the lungs. But as long as he, you know, especially if you have a bleeding mass, that surgery is going to be palliative. You're taking away the source of bleeding and often those dogs recover quite nicely from surgery and can go home and at least have more quality time with their family. So I will do splenectomy if it's already spread, as long as the owners know what's going on and we can still try chemo and supplements and things like that. So I think it's a reasonable question, but I really want to know if they have metastasis before I take them to surgery. Um, Jasmine wants to know why is the lifespan so short after, oh, same, same person, uh, just scrolling back down, catching up with your question, Jasmine, why is the lifespan so short after splenectomy? Yes, it's because the cancer has likely spread. So even if we do chest x-rays and they're read out as normal, there's no evidence of spread detectable on x-rays and the ultrasound, you know, it hasn't spread to the liver. Most of those dogs have metastasis before surgery or the chemo alone is not enough to stop the metastasis. So they live longer, we slow it down, we don't cure them. Um, so again, it's because those cells, another way that this cancer can spread and one of the reasons that the dogs that have 
blood in their abdomen, so the hemoabdomen at the time of diagnosis, it can spread that way as well. So those little cancer cells that are in the blood, that's in the belly, I'm, like you guys can see me, I'm, I'm touching my belly area, um, but it can coat the other organs in the abdomen and that's another way it can spread. So that's called transplantation. So it's just a tough cancer. But again, I have to tell you the clients that treat with me, um, you know, that get six to nine months and we, I've gotten dogs to a year. Gunner was one of my lymphoma patients and he was over a year out from his lymphoma. April Fool's Day, I kid you not guys, had a hemo abdomen and he lived to April 2nd the following year. So, you know, there are some dogs that get out a year, but it, it's just harder to get them. Most of them there like, you know, which is different than osteosarcoma and mast cell tumors and lymphoma. Um, yeah, so Morgan says her friend and coworker is 11 year old Bassett, um, just had splenectomy Monday. I know you're, everybody's waiting and hopefully it will be benign. Um, so fingers and paws crossed for that, but, um, if it's not, and you know, there are some other tumors out there as well. So the rule is about two thirds of them are malignant and about two thirds of the malignant splenic tumors are hemangio. So there's still some other ones. And I know that there was a question that was on, um, Facebook yesterday and it wants, um, talked about what some of the other ones. So what's a grade one splenic sarcoma? So there are other connective tissues, other sarcomas that we can see in the spleen. So, um, and some of these low grade ones, we might not recommend chemo. So we're gonna wait for that biopsy to come back. Um, but there's some other tumors. Sometimes we see mast cell tumors and lymphoma. You can see smooth muscle tumors, lyomyosarcoma, um, so that's another one that you can see as well. Those I typically still do recommend chemo and they do a little bit better, but um, those need chemo as well. So we're gonna wait for that biopsy report, Morgan, and hopefully you guys will have some good news. Um, Gail wants to know about extra vitamin D and this actually just came up in the Q&A that I did for veterinarians. Um, there's some studies, I know of one where they, they're looking at dogs that have cancer and another study where they looked at dogs I think it was Labradors with mast cell tumor that have low vitamin D. So I'm not, you know, I think if measuring vitamin D and considering supplementation, they can have side effects from vitamin D, but it's not something that I'm routinely recommending, especially if those levels are normal because you don't want vitamin D toxicity, which is a real thing. Um, Kathy wants to know, commented on the post for the free ebook. If you did that on that post, usually within a couple of minutes, you should get an email into Messenger. Um, saying, I think you have to say yes, and then I think you have to put your email. So um, I'll keep scrolling, Kathy. If you didn't get it, we'll make sure at the end that you get that as well. Uh, scrolling up, let's see, Ashley, Blue Pit Nose Dixie almost a year ago, lost, um, work in the field, took her to her vet for routine x-rays um, on the diagnosis for the week, assisted in surgery and lost her a month later. So I'm so sorry for that. So it, it's a tough cancer, guys. And I really, really hope that we get better early detection. And, you know, I'm really excited about some of the things going on at Minnesota and that we have some new treatments to talk about and that, that some of these supplements are easy to add. Uh, I think Kara says she got, Kara, I assume you were saying you got the book immediately. So uh, hopefully, Kathy, you have gotten it by the end of the Q&A. Okay. Thanks guys for bearing with me as I read your guys' questions. So Dan, uh, his dog is two and a half years past, um, so subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma. Great, so I mentioned that those are the better ones, right? So not as good as skin. And these tall questions, I'm like too short. Um, not as good as skin, but also good. So usually um, the median survival time is about a year and a half um, with surgery and chemo. And definitely the ones that I see that are out long like that, they tend to be long-term survivors. I think Claude, my patient, um, we just rechecked and he's either three or four years out. So that's great. No signs of returning tumors. She was put on Chinese herbs and some mushrooms, now just mushrooms and mussels. Will the tumor grow back in the same area when? <laughs> Good question, hopefully not. Um, so, you know, two things you always wanna be on the lookout for when your dog has a tumor in the skin or the subcutaneous is regrowth. If you have clean and wide margins, so normal rim of tissue with, you know, one to two centimeters around it. So that dog, Claude, his tumor was on his belly near the prepuce. We had to go back and have our surgeon get wider margins so to prevent recurrence. And then we did chemo to pre prevent spread. So two battlefronts. 
tumor growing back where it was originally growing, hopefully not with clean and wide margins and tumor metastasis or spread. And that's where you would be doing chest X-rays and ultrasound to look for that. So um, hopefully it won't, you know, it's hard for me to say that you're ever completely out of the woods, um, but two and a half years is super fantastic and makes me very, very happy. Um, <laughs> So somebody wants to know what big word that was, and I'm assuming was that lyomyosarcoma, the smooth muscle tumor? There's a lot of big words in oncology, and I don't like them. I was actually just telling my nurses we like to abbreviate stuff in oncology. That's why hemangiosarcoma is HSA. So um, sorry for the big words. I'll try to keep it clean, though. Um, what is the best treatment option for stage three hemangiosarcoma? So, um, depends on where it has spread. Um, and so in general, it's a good question, I guess. So let's just kind of go global for that. So um, after surgery, if the owners want to do chemotherapy, I typically recommend a doxorubicin based protocol um, every three weeks for six doses. I also put them on metronomic low dose cyclophosphamide to help modulate the immune system. And so I will use those two concurrently. So injectable chemo every three weeks with metronomic chemo. I'll add their supplements. Um, so I have them on IM Unity, have them on Apicaps. And then after they finish their six doses of chemo, I'm gonna do more chest X-rays and ultrasound. So hopefully we prove that there's still no evidence of spread that we can detect. And then I'm gonna consider maintenance metronomic chemo. There are some studies that show these low dose oral chemo protocols can be effective, but we're still sort of in the infancy of how much more time you'll get. But that's a discussion I'll have with the owners if they're interested and keep going. So a couple different protocols for metronomic. I will continue the cyclophosphamide, often add a non anti-inflammatory and low dose doxycycline, which is um, a chemotherapy, uh, an antibiotic that we use for tick-borne diseases that we're gonna use at half dose. So that would be, and then if they have metastasis or spread, I usually will add palladia, um, which is a mast cell tumor oral chemotherapy drug to their protocol instead, actually instead of um, the doxorubicin if they have spread at the time. So hopefully that answers. And then again, well, should we be adding things like losartan and propranolol? We're still learning about that. So not routinely doing that yet, but I'm excited that we're learning about it. Um, Felicia wants to know, is the cancer common in beagles or did mine just get the poop end of the stick? I'm not laughing, it was just funny the way that you said that. Thank you for keeping it clean. Speaking of keeping it clean, um, you know, when I went to Dr. Modiano's lecture, again, who's really one of the top oncologists and researchers, um, he's a brilliant man on this, you know, he really sort of challenged a lot of the oncologists in the room to, because we think about this as a cancer of large breed dogs and shepherds and some of the other breeds that I mentioned, but we can see it in small dogs as well. I've seen it in Westies, I've seen it in um, Schnauzers, I've seen it in the Havanese, you know, other small dogs. So. Uh, beagles, when I think of beagles, one of the cancers that I worry about with them is bladder cancer. But, you know, sometimes you can do all the right things, guys, and your pets can still get cancer. So um, fortunately, I think you got the poop end of the stick, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, Dixie's was in her spleen. Anna, you're very welcome. Uh, so Denny wants to know, with that being said, should we stop the Unibio? So I missed probably the first part of that. So this is me, I'm just giving you my two cents guys, but I don't keep them on Unibio if they're not having bleeding. So I would talk to your vet. I typically um, don't keep them on um, Unibio um, unless they're having bleeding issues. So you could stop, you know, some of the issues with, hang on, with um, Unibio is, you know, with a supplement is, they potentially could have liver toxicity issues and things like that. So I save it for a rainy day. So I might put it on the shelf and save it for a rainy. Hopefully uh, you won't have those bleeding days. Um, uh, Brianna asked a very interesting question, a little bit of a side question, but this has come up multiple times this week in my patients. So it's a great question. So she wants to know their association with Apoquil and cancer. So that is, and I don't use Apoquil. It's not a medication that I stock in my cancer clinic, but it is for skin issues. And there is concern that if a pet has cancer, any cancer, 
um, that it could promote cancer. We don't think it causes pets to have cancer, but if they have cancer, I will get them off their Apoquil. There's a new drug called Cytopoint that's by Zoetis, and that would be a better alternative, so I would recommend that. So again, we don't think it causes cancer, but in pets that have cancer, it can help them grow and metastasize in theory. So, um, that is the concern, but it is a great drug otherwise. So Felicia again, um, so she wants to know for her beagle that got the poop end of the stick, um, is a prognosis for splenic that was found before rupture, is it better? So yes, it is. If you look at, if you kind of start to separate the, the dogs, um, that she's never had a family that felt the spleen. So good for you. You know, there's some that are really big and you can feel, and I, I want to go back to the size question because that does not necessarily help us predict what it is. But um, ones that rupture tend to do better. Um, but again, I've seen exceptions to the rule on both sides. So just because they ruptured, I wouldn't not take them to surgery or not give them chemotherapy, but it does look like the non-ruptured ones are the ones that we tend to get out nine months. And the ones that have ruptured are the closer to six months. If you look at the dogs that have surgery and then chemotherapy. Um, size guys, size big tumors do not necessarily equal hemangiosarcoma. And um, there was another study. So we talked about dogs that had rupture are more likely to, you know, that come in with a hema abdomen, it's more likely to be malignant and hemangio. Incidental splenic masses are more likely to be benign. And in one study, I want to say of about 100 dogs, 70% of them were benign. So these were dogs that were getting ultrasounds for something else and happened to find a splenic mass that again, some of these look really scary. So they didn't monitor them, the spleen got, pill got pulled meaning it had surgery. So again, just because your dog has a big tumor or that just because there's a mass in the spleen does not mean that it's a mangiosarcoma. So hopefully that was helpful. So just reading another question. Um, my pup was diagnosed with a splenic mass. It got removed and told it was cancer. Never told exactly what kind given six to eight months. At eight months now, she's acting normal. So had a splenic mass, we got it removed. So Blanca, I'm wondering, so the mass was not submitted to the lab for biopsy for histopathology. So yeah, it's hard to know what it was. Um, and it doesn't sound like your dog, your pup has gotten surgery or um, chemotherapy. So there are, I have had a few dogs with hemangiosarcoma that did not get chemo. I actually went back and reread the biopsy and got second opinions. You will have some long-term survivors. Um, it's just unfortunately not enough that I wouldn't recommend chemo, but that's a great reminder if your dog has a lump or bump removed or a mass removed, it should definitely be submitted to the lab. So it's hard to know what it was. But I'm glad your dog's still alive at eight months. That's awesome news, right? Um, are there other, Sabrina wants to know, are there other cancers that present as right atrial hemangiosarcomas? So Mike is just saying, yes, we were just told it was, it was submitted. It was cancer. So I would, Blanca, just go back to your question, ask to see the biopsy report. If it was submitted, there's a report in the record somewhere, um, and they can give it to you. And then we, you know, you could have a better idea of what it was and more information. So, um, maybe it was a low grade tumor. Maybe it was one of the other tumors that we talked about in the spleen. So. Definitely, if it was submitted, you should get that biopsy report. It is your right as an owner to ask for a copy of that. Are there other cancers in the right that present as right atrium? So yeah, there are. And the hard part with tumors in the heart is a lot of them are not biopsied. So they're often presumptive diagnosed. So we were diagnosed one year ago and our vet is wondering if it's a mangio. Yeah, so there are some other heart-based tumors that are more slowly growing. One is called chemodectoma. Um, so it is possible for sure. So if your dog's still alive at a year, I agree with your vet that maybe it is something else. Um, and I'm, you know, it's glad. And that's the hard part. It's sort of like brain masses in dogs, you know, brain cancer is, it's really hard to biopsy a lot of them. So we often make a diagnosis based on appearance and location, and that can be very, very hard. Uh, Brian wants to know how often does it go to the central nervous system? Um, we lost our golden very quickly after it attacked his brain and spine. So he swam one day and then was basically paralyzed. So I'm assuming from your question though, you didn't say it, Brian, that um, 
that it was that you know that he had splenic hemangio. So the number one cancer to spread to the central nervous system is hemangiosarcoma. I don't make up numbers that I don't know offhand, and um, I don't know the percentage. If we and if we know the percentage, again going back to not a lot of them are diet, you know, confirmed. But yeah, it it can spread there for sure. And like I said, it's the number one cancer to metastasize to the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and that sounds very traumatic for you and your family. And I'm really sorry about that. So that is horrible. I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, lost Husky, fine one minute, gone 15 minutes later, had no idea, had cancer, turned out several sites, but it was one of these heart that ruptured. Yeah. So this is one of the really hard things about these cancers when they're growing in the spleen and they rupture very quickly and they're bleeding internally. When they're in the heart, they actually bleed into the heart sac. So the heart is surrounded by a balloon, for lack of better terms. And if they bleed into that, the balloon fills up with blood. And then if you can imagine the heart inside the thing can't pump and effectively do its job. Um, so they start to run into arrhythmias and all of these other issues because the heart can't pump effectively. So um, it can be very, very traumatic. And I'm sorry, this is just a depressing one, but you know, it's super, super hard guys. Um, and you should have said, Shelly said, this is common to never know until the pup has died. And it is unfortunately, and that's one of the hard things about this. So I just saw another comment up top that someone says it's crushing and it absolutely is. So we have one that's subdermal. So just under the skin removed in December, still with us in September, which is honestly what I would expect, um, because the subcutaneous ones do much better. Uh, so the question is, was wondering why a second surgery was not advised. I only recommend a second surgery if the first surgery did not get those clean margins. So what do I mean by margins? So when you remove a malignant cancer, if they see cancer cells, if this is the tumor that's removed, if they see cancer, or if this is the mass is removed, if they see cancer cells at the cut edge, here, there's cancer cells still left in our pet. And so when they look at the cut edge, they want the tumor to kind of be more centralized and this to be a normal rim of normal tissue around the cancer. So not every dog will need a second surgery. One of the things with skin and subcutaneous tumors, guys, is if we know what it is before we go to surgery, is it benign or malignant with an aspirate, then we can you know, know whether that surgery needs to be big, that first surgery. And I will use this as a time, because one of the things I wanted to remember to tell you guys is, I know this is again about splenic hemangiosarcoma predominantly, but I just want you to know that we have on my website, Dr. Sue Cancer Vet in the pet resources section, we have these for dogs and cats. And these are, what are these? These are little skin maps. So you can keep track of your pet's lumps and bumps and measure them and then bring this to your vet. And I send these home with my clients as well when I'm keeping track of their lumps and bumps. So you can keep them there. And then when you go to your vet, you can remember where they are. And so, um, you know, you can have calipers. We uh, use these little calipers and you can get these on my website as well. And we'll throw a code in um, if you're looking for them. So I have little calipers. I do have digital ones that are, are more expensive, but you don't need digital, but these are just great calipers that you can use to measure a lump on your dog. Note that it's on the left leg, put it on the skin map, and then you can keep track of it. And so if your dog is a lump or bump, you will go to your vet, they will aspirate it. And if it's malignant, they will know that. And then hopefully the first surgery will be able to be a big surgery, see something, do something, why wait, aspirate. So guys, if you haven't heard about my lumps and bumps program, if the mass is the size of a pea, or an M&M &M, um, or a Skittle and they're a month, go to your vet and ask for an aspirate. If you know where it is before you go in, you will make your vet's job easier and we can keep track of those lumps and bumps. But again, if we know that it's malignant, hopefully you won't need a second surgery because the first one can be big. If it's benign, we can do a much smaller surgery. Why do we wanna find them so small? So we can cure these dogs and get their tumors off with one surgery. All right, hopefully that helped and um, do, do, do. So this is where you can find calipers. If you're curious, um, they are on my website and I uh, will throw a code. So Dr. Sue 2018 will give you 15% off all of the stuff, all of the, uh, the calipers on there. So the plastic calipers, caliper pens, and also digital calipers if you feel like you want those as well. So Dr. Sue 2018 is your code to get 15% off. Skin maps for free, obviously. 
um, and their dog and cat ones. And again, those are on my website um, in the pet resources section, or you can just do forward slash skin dash maps as well. So that is another thing. So guys, we have about 11 minutes left. I told my boys, uh, Kale and Hudson, that I would be off um, by 10 so I could give them kisses goodnight, even though they're supposed to be in bed at 930, but they usually wait for me to finish. Um, so Rachel wants to know in high risk breeds, would abdominal ultrasound be advised? Yes. So Rachel, I'm guessing you're joining late and that's okay. Welcome, but you can go back and watch. We talked about this in the beginning earlier, by the time they're middle aged, I recommend an ultrasound and chest x-rays twice a year. So we talk a, a little bit about that in the beginning. You can go back. I'm going to try to just answer a few more questions in the last 10 minutes that we have. Guys, has this been helpful? Is this something that you're, you know, finding useful? If it is, I'm going to ask for a couple of favors for you from before we go. Can you please tag friends that you think this might be useful? Please share this on any friend site or again, if you have pet resources group that you think this will be helpful. And again, if you can um, uh, please remember to go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and remember there's lots of other informational videos about myths and misconceptions with chemo and other medications I want you to have on hand if your pet is going through chemo. So nausea medication, appetite stimulants, and things like that. Um, Caitlin wants to know, not Caitlin, yeah, Caitlin, um, I almost said Robert. Caitlin Roberts wants to know, can you treat hemangio with, uh, with stereotactic radiation? Thank you, Lynn, for sharing. So. Um, in general, no. So what is stereotactic radiation? Stereotactic radiation is a very precise form of radiation. Usually it's gonna be done for non-surgical cancers. Um, so the most common ones that I've experienced treating because I did cyber knife stereotactic radiation for about seven years at the hospital I used to be at was brain tumors and nose tumors, bone cancer, some oral cancers, usually of the upper jaw. Those would be the common ones. Usually for splenic would not I haven't done it. I don't have experience with it. And I not one that I would typically think about using stereotactic radiation. I think, you know, one of the big concerns is one, what if it's benign? You probably just cut it out. And we don't know what it is beforehand. This is one where aspirates before surgery are usually non-diagnostic and usually lead to abdominal bleeding for the splenic form. Um, I have treated a subcutaneous one, but it ended up needing to go to surgery afterwards. So that would not be, that would not be my treatment of choice. Um, there is the YouTube channel, but if you just go to YouTube and type in Dr. Sue Cancer Vet, you will find me there. Um, so Heather says, you know, so her dog was diagnosed with oral hemangiosarcoma on the bottom of her tongue, told it's extremely uncommon. <laughs> you know, the, I, I hate tongue tumors, I'll be honest, you know, because it's really hard to do big surgery there. Um, I don't know that we know enough about it, but in general, the ones that aren't in this the superficial skin, I would be concerned and I would probably do chemotherapy for your dog. I'm glad she's feeling well um, and I love the Labradoric, so I'm really sorry that you're going through that. Um, someone said experience with Ginger's diet, Ginger had her spleen removed. So um, at first I thought Ginger's diet, Nancy, was a commercial diet, so I'm not sure if that's your dog's diet um thank you Kara that for finding it helpful so um I'm not sure exactly about that but I'm going to try to just scan through see what other questions that we can answer because I know there was a lot of questions I scrolled up um Felicia wanted to know lots of questions from Felicia is additional additional staining commonly needed to get a diagnosis so in general no most of the time hemangiosarcoma is going to be routinely diagnosed easily on your first biopsy report. There are some where they're not sure and they may recommend things like Vimentin or other things like that to see if it's one of the other sarcomas or not. So not common, but anything's possible in the world of cancer. So sometimes they will add special stains. So that's where they're just gonna go back and apply more stains to more of the tissue slides. The good news is you don't need to, you know, do anything more invasive to your surgery your surgery. I'm getting tired, guys. You don't have to do any more surgery for your pet. They can do the special stains on the original biopsy. Um, so this is just about diet. Um, it's sort of a general question looking for homemade food. 
uh, for six and a half for health. And so that's not an easy question to answer. Um, the co-author of the book that I wrote, Dog Cancer Survival Guide, uh, has a home cooked diet that I like. You just, you have to home cook and usually for most dogs, you're gonna be doing it about every four days. I have a hard time cooking for my family, so I don't home cook for my dogs, but that would be one. Um, so you can get that. I think you can get the ebook for the thing on dogcancerbook.com and we can probably throw that in the link um, as well. So that would be, I have had a nutritionist look over that diet and as long as they're getting a multivitamin and now there's actually a, another vitamin supplement um, that you can put with that as well. So that would be another option. So just make sure if you're doing a home cooked diet that you either have a nutritionist or it's something that a nutritionist has reviewed. Another one is balanceit.com and that's another one where you, they can help you with a diet. But in general, if you're gonna home cook, make sure it, it's been reviewed by a nutritionist. And a lot of nutritionists will do phone consults. So that would be something that you could look online, uh, American College of Veterinary Nutritionists and see if you can find someone who would um, look over the diet for you. All right, guys, we are wrapping up another one. Let me just make sure I got all my notes. Um, the things I wanted to remind you guys. So I told you guys about the skin maps. I told you guys about the code. If you wanna buy calipers, um, just a reminder, the um, vlogs um, about chemo myths is number 42 and number 38 about medications you should have on hand at home. Um, and I think that's it from my little list of reminders. Next month, I don't remember what tumor we're doing. It's on my cheat sheet over there. I want to say mammary tumors in cats is next month, and then mammary tumors breast cancer in dogs is the following month. So we will be doing those topics, and you can look for more information. This blog or this uh, Q&A will be on Facebook, um, probably uploads in a few minutes, and will be on YouTube. Sometimes I find the Q&As easier to find on YouTube, so that would be someplace else that we could look at. Um, Anna wants to know what are the com or what are the comments? Please comment about doxorubicin and chemo versus metronomic in terms of side effects and results. Okay, last question. Um, so doxorubicin is the classic one. That's the intravenous one that I mentioned earlier in the Q and A. So there is a study looking at some of the metronomic. So those are low dose oral chemo, and they could be comparable. My, and I took a, a deep breath with this. So my, thanks Kara for joining. I'll see you guys soon. Um, my thoughts is I like the standard of care. There's more studies and it's tried and true. If an owner really didn't want to do injectable chemo, we could do metronomic, but we don't have as many studies showing that it's equivalent or there are some studies looking at it. I think, you know, guys, one of the reasons with the mangiosarcoma, I told you the median survival with chemo is six to nine months. And there's definitely a group of oncologists out there, including myself, that think that these guys need to be on chronic therapy because often it's around the time you're finishing chemo that they're metastasizing. So I typically recommend the injectable chemo and then metronomic. So again, the low dose cyclophosphamide, the non anti inflammatory, and the, the doxycycline. One of the things that's nice about metronomic chemo is it tends to be less expensive and you don't need a, an oncologist or a veterinarian who is used to giving chemo and um, you know has all the safety precautions. And actually at the end of 2019, Jenny, if you're still here, uh, she's a licensed veterinary oncology technician who knows all about this. They're changing the rules for veterinary oncologists and veterinary general practitioners that really up, up bumping up the safety regulations. So we're all gonna have to have more safety precautions in our clinic, which is gonna make it harder for most practitioners to be giving chemotherapy. So metronomic would be a good plan B, typically less side effects, less expensive, don't need all the special equipment and have to worry about chemotherapy safety. So it would be a good plan B, but if I had my druthers, I would do doxorubicin and then follow up with metronomic. So Anna, hopefully that answered your question well or just answered your question, maybe not well, because my tongue's a little bit tied. It's the end of a long day. Um, someone says, mangiosarcoma in the kidneys. Uh, as a primary location or as a metastatic site, can so a spread site can be um, not that common. Uh, the most common kidney cancer that we see is usually like a renal carcinoma and sometimes lymphoma involves it as well. But again, I would absolutely, um, if it's unilateral, sorry, if it's on one kidney, usually you're gonna remove that kidney. They can still, as long as the other kidney is still functioning, usually this is gonna be a cancer in one kidney, not gonna be in both. That would be more typical of lymphoma to be in both kidneys. After chemotherapy, I would, 
after surgery, after the kidneys removed, I would definitely recommend chemotherapy. So uh, pretty similar survival times to the other internal forms. All right, guys, thank you so much. I think this was one of our longer ones, but it just goes to show um, how challenging these cancers are. Just on a personal note, guys, I'm sorry for all of you that have gone through this. I know this is a tough cancer. It's often very traumatic and very quick and it takes us by surprise. So my heart goes out to all of you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and I really appreciate you guys all being here. Um, and feel free to let me know if you like this and if you're looking forward to more information and anything that I can do to make these a little bit more useful. I tried to keep up with all the questions. You guys were great. Thank you for putting up with me. Um, I'm a little bit tired after a long day and I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your busy days to be with me. All right, guys, thank you so much. Kick cancer's butt and um, thanks for coming. <laughs>